Welcome guys to another Drug Chug episode and today we are continuing diuretics. So if you guys followed us along the last part prior we talked about thiazide and thiazide like diuretics. In this part we're going to continue and we're going to start with loop diuretics. So let's get right into it. So the next class of diuretics that we see are our loop diuretics. And anytime you hear the word loop the first thing you should think about is potent or powerful because our loop diuretics are our most powerful diuretics that we have. And the first one we have here is a product called Bumetanide. Brand name is Bumex. And this is the most potent out of the three. Next, we have Torsamide or Demodex. And then finally, our most popular loop diuretic is Ferrosamide or Lasix. So all of these loop diuretics can be dosed daily, twice a day, or up to three times a day. And one interesting thing is ferrosamide and the brand name Lasix. And the brand name is actually very clever because Lasix lasts six hours. And that's why they named it Lasix, which is a pretty cool thing. It helps you remember. Another thing to note is that all the starting doses that I've listed here are actually all equivalent to the next diuretic. So for bumetanide, the 0.5 milligrams is as powerful as the torsamide 10 milligrams, which is as powerful as the ferrosamide 20 milligrams. So where do these loop diuretics actually work? Well, before we were talking about thiazides and thiazide-like diuretics, and those worked right here at the distal convoluted tubule. Well, the loop diuretics work right before it in this area here. And this is called the ascending loop of Henle. So these agents, because they're so powerful, aren't used to treat high blood pressure. These diuretics are only used to treat edema. So these are really good in patients that have heart failure or cirrhosis or any condition where they're holding on to a lot of water that needs to be excreted. So what makes loop diuretic so potent is that not only does it make sodium chloride and water remain in the urine, but it also makes potassium, hydrogen, calcium, and magnesium also stay in the urine. So we know our thiazides only do the top three molecules, whereas loop diuretics do all of these molecules. Because we have so many electrolytes in the urine, the body's going to pull more water into the urine so that we could pee it out. So some common side effects we see with our loop diuretics is because we pee out so many electrolytes, we might see a deficiency or a decrease in the serum potassium and magnesium level. This is to the point where the patient could actually be required to take supplementation for potassium and magnesium. So it's a good idea just to check their levels and make sure everything is all right. Another side effect that we might see, and this is typically with larger doses, is autotoxicity. So if they have any uh, ringing in the ear, tinnitus, or a hearing impairment, that's also something that we could see in these patients. Another side effect could be something called metabolic alkalosis, meaning the blood is becoming basic or less acidic. And the reason for this is because we are peeing out more and more hydrogen ions. The more hydrogen ions that we pee out and we excrete, the more basic our blood comes. And the last thing to note here is old diuretics can cause dehydration, but loop diuretics have the potential to cause the most dehydration because they are the most potent and because they're going to cause you to lose the most fluid. I do want to quickly mention sulfa allergies when it comes to thiazide and loop diuretics. Even though computers are getting better at this, it's not uncommon to see a flag pop up when we have a patient with a sulfa allergy and they're prescribed a thiazide or a loop diuretic. So if we look at the structures here, here we have hydrochlorothiazide, which is our thiazide diuretic. Here we have ferrosamide, which is our loop diuretic. And here off to the end, we have our sulfamethoxazole, which is actually an antibiotic. And whenever we talk about sulfa allergies, it's typically because of this sulfa drug. 
And you can see that all of these drugs have this group, this sulfonamide group. It was believed that this sulfonamide group causes the allergy. And because we see the same sulfonamide group on furosemide and hydrochlorothiazide, it was believed that it will cause the allergic reaction. Well, this is not true. A patient with a sulfa allergy can take furosemide. They can take hydrochlorothiazide. And because we're talking about allergic reactions, I do want to quickly go over what happens in a patient that has a sulfa allergy. They could have anything from a skin rash to hives to itching. They could have breathing problems. Or if it's severe enough, they could have Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which is the burning of the skin. But again, if they have a sulfa allergy, it's okay to give them furosemide. It's okay to give them hydrochlorothiazide. And the last diuretic to talk about are the potassium sparing diuretics. So in the first part of the series, we talked about thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. In this section of the series, we just finished loop diuretics. And now let's get into the potassium sparing diuretics. So here we have potassium sparing diuretics. They can also be called aldosterone antagonists because they antagonize the hormone aldosterone in our body. And here we only have two agents. We have spironolactone, which is brand name aldactone, and eplerinone, or brand name Inspra. And here they have a pretty wide dosing range. And the reason for that is because they could be used for several things. The first thing we would use potassium sparing diuretics for is hypertension. They could also be used to treat edema. And at certain doses, they could also be used to treat heart failure. Just like our thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics, these diuretics also work at the distal convoluted tubule right here. And what's different is they actually spare potassium, meaning the potassium isn't going to stay in the urine and be excreted. The body's going to hold on to potassium, which means we'll have elevated serum potassium levels. Because these potassium sparing diuretics are also known as aldosterone antagonists, which is a hormone, it's not uncommon to see that they actually antagonize testosterone at high levels. So when these agents start to antagonize testosterone, we see some side effects. And at high doses, we could see something called gynecomastia, which happens in men. And this means that the breast tissue will start developing in men. They can also have sexual dysfunction. For women, we can see breast tenderness and also menstrual irregularities. Another side effect can be hyperkalemia, which means there's too much potassium in our blood. And remember, these are potassium sparing diuretics. So all the potassium is going to be reabsorbed into our bloodstream and it's not going to stay in the urine. And this is different than our other two diuretics. This is the only one that spares potassium. So some patient counseling tips whenever we have patients on diuretics. It's a good idea to tell them that this is a water pill, especially for our older population, because they'll know that this will make them pee. Now, it's also a good idea to tell them to not take it before bedtime. Because they make them pee, it's going to make sense that they'll stay up all night peeing. And the last thing is, it's a good idea to let them know that they could become dehydrated or dizzy. So anytime they take a water pill, make sure they are drinking water and they stand up slowly. So let's have a quick summary of everything we learned. So in the first section of this video series, we talked about thiazides and thiazide-like diuretics. We talked about how both of these work in the distal convoluted tubule. For our thiazide diuretics, we had hydrochlorothiazide also known as microzide, and it's abbreviated as HCTZ. We also have chlorothiazide, or brand name diural. Our thiazide-like diuretics, we talked about metolazone, brand name zeroxalin, indapamide, brand name lozol, and then chlorothalidone, or hygrotin. Next, in this video, we talked about loop diuretics. We talked about the big three, which is bumetanide, or brand name bumex, torsamide, demodex, and ferrosamide, Lasix. And this worked in the ascending loop of Henle. And then we finished off with potassium sparing diuretics. Here we talked about spironolactone, brand name aldactone, and then eplerinone, brand name Inspra. 
And we talked about how these are the only diuretics that cause potassium reabsorption back into the blood and how they have a side effect of gynecomastia. All right, you guys made it to the end. So like I promised, let's take a short quiz to see what retained. And this quiz is for both part one and part two of the diuretic series. All right, so question one, which of these drugs do not work in the distal convoluted tubule? Is it A, furosemide, B, hydrochlorothiazide, C, metolazone, or D, chlorthalidone? Question two, which type of diuretic is the most powerful? Is it thiazides, thiazide-like, loop, or potassium sparing? Question three, which diuretic is the only one that increases blood potassium levels? Is it spironolactone, indapamide, torsamide, or demodex? Question four. Which diuretic has the potential side effect of gynecomastia? Is it spironolactone, chlorthalidone, metolazone, or furosemide? All right, guys, we made it to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button if you haven't done so. That really helps us out and it helps us reach other people who need this help. Also, check out some merch that we have. We have some new t-shirt designs all the time. And go ahead and look at our Patreon. We have deals starting at just a dollar to help support the channel. If you guys have any questions, as always, leave a comment down below. Until next time.